Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We now begin EU Japan Roundtable, Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement, and beyond the EU and Japan towards carbon neutrality in 2050. My name is Kazuhiko Takemoto, President of Overseas Environment Cooperation Center. I will be serving as a moderator today. To begin today's roundtable event, I would like to ask the three guest speakers to give us opening remarks. First, on behalf of the organizers of today's event, I would like to ask President Tomoko Ueki of Doshisha University to give us opening remark. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ueki, a president of Doshisha University. We are truly honored to be co-organizing this roundtable with delegation of the European Union to Japan, Embassy of France in Japan, and EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation. We were originally planning to have this event in Kyoto, where Kyoto Protocol originates, as well as where our university is located. In commemoration of the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, we wish we could have invited the ambassadors of 27 member states of the European Union, as well as ambassador of the EU to Japan and the distinguished panelists to Kyoto. However, due to the spread of the COVID-19, we, we decided to hold this event online. The relations between our university and Europe go back a long way to 1872 when Joseph Hardy Nishima, the founder of our university, visited educational institutions in European countries. That experience of his has become one of the origins of our university's educational principles. And in academic year 2017, we opened our very first overseas campus called Doshisha EU campus at Tubingen University, which is one of our partner universities. We started educational programs on Germany and EU last academic year. Going forward, we hope to continuously serve as a hub connecting our university and Germany as well as EU through various educational research programs. At home, the EU Info. EUI at our university opened in 1976, making it the third to be established in Japan. And as such, we seek to promote an understanding of the EU across the broader community. Furthermore, in April this year, in order to promote practical research and development on environmental issues, together with Daikin Industries, we established Doshisha Daikin Next Environment Research Center on our campus. In the center, towards reducing GHG, a new technology for CO2 capture, decomposition, and reuse is being developed. The partnership is also pursuing the development of air conditioners with even higher efficiencies. We are confident that we can contribute to solving the climate change issue, which is the topic of today's event, by fostering human resources through a new form of education comprising joint research as well as science and technology development, which will do good for the Earth's environment for the future generations. Today, I believe that many students are participating in this event. Doshisha has been supporting initiatives led by students on environmental issues, particularly the World Student Environment Network Global Summit, which was established by our student volunteers in 2008, has been highly evaluated as an admirable activity by students. The summit was once again held in our university in 2018, where students from all around the world had a heated discussion on how to de develop a sustainable social environment. I hope your participation to this roundtable will be a great opportunity for you to think about how we should address this global issue and to take action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ueki. We would now like to give the microphone to Mayor of Kyoto, who has agreed to participate in this program despite his very busy public schedule. Mr. Kadokawa. Floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I am Daisaku Kadokawa, Mayor of Kyoto. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I would also like to take this opportunity to all the ambassadors present participating in this webinar. I would also like to take this opportunity for everyone who have provided us with the support we needed. 
I also like to thank President Ueki of Doshisha University. Under the pandemic, a great number of people have their lives taken away by COVID-19. And it is a critical moment that we fight, have to fight against the disease. And it is regrettable that you cannot come to Kyoto, but please do come visit us as soon as the pandemic is over. I would also like to take this opportunity to EU Japan Center for the support that it has provided. Across the borders, a great number of students and other people are tuning in to this program. I think that this in and of itself is a demonstration of their commitment to fight against the global warming. And I think this is quite a timely event commemorating the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Kyoto is the city that has given birth to Kyoto Protocol, which is the first of its kind in human history. Over the long history, Kyoto has developed a, its unique culture to give appropriate closure to things. And we also have living aesthetics of life as well as the philosophy of life. 23 years ago, representatives of the countries around the world has gathered to give birth to this important protocol with all the different agendas and intentions. Serious discussion have culminated in the formation of Kyoto Protocol. It's been feared that an agreement will be very difficult at COP3. After one day extension of the conference, Kyoto International Conference Center was filled with a round of applause. And that was the moment of the birth of Kyoto Protocol. An international participant in COP3 stated that everyone attended all the sessions embraced by the spirit of Kyoto where the nature and people's lives melded beautifully over the long period of thousand years of history. The participant went as far as to say that it was the energy of Kyoto that has enabled the agreement. The strength of Kyoto was thus demonstrated and that was when we have renewed our commitment to our fight against the global warming. With this renewed commitment, we have promulgated city ordinance, setting the goal of 10% reduction in GHG emissions, which was easily achieved within the first 10 years. And Chancellor, German Chancellor Merkel came to Japan when she attended a symposium commemorating the 10th anniversary of Kyoto Protocol. The phrase at that meeting, she said a phrase, do you Kyoto, which literally meant, are you doing good things to the environment? This has become a popular phrase across the world and we are very proud of that phrase too. And Kyoto Protocol has served as the springboard for the Paris Agreement in the long run. And Kyoto and Paris look forward to work together. And last year, IPCC General Assembly was also organized in Kyoto. And guideline for the implementation of Paris Agreement was adopted. And it is now has a nickname of IPCC Kyoto Guideline. And on this front as well, I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mayor Kadokawa. You gave us a very powerful and encouraging comment. To deliver her opening remarks, Your Excellency, you have the floor, please. Thank you, dear President Ueki, dear Mayor Kadokawa, distinguished speakers and guests. My name is Ina Lepre. I'm the German ambassador. As a representative of the EU Council Presidency, it is my pleasure to give an opening address to this roundtable. First of all, I would like to thank today's host and organizers for setting up such a distinguished panel of experts. 
It has, as has been said, a special meaning to hold this event in Kyoto, where 191 countries for the first time made binding commitments to limit and reduce emissions. Almost exactly five years ago, 197 states agreed in Paris to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. It was a decisive moment of climate diplomacy. Since then, the challenges have not only become more, but also bigger. Natural disasters like floods and wildfires, and of course, biggest pandemic of a century. These events make us painfully aware how human behavior and global challenges are interconnected. Increasing human pressure on the natural environment can drive the emergence of new diseases. Therefore, by strengthening our health systems with a One Health approach and better protecting the natural environment, we can reduce the risks of future outbreaks of new diseases. The importance of the Japanese Prime Minister Suga's recent announcement to make Japan climate neutral by 2050 and to promote renewable energies cannot be overstated. It will lead to structural changes in industry as well as in people's behavior. Prime Minister Suga emphasized that, contrary to previous beliefs, climate action is not a constraint to economic growth, but can, on the contrary, lead to more innovation and prosperity in the future. In the EU, we share this assessment. The EU has pledged to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. We are furthermore working on raising our 2030 ambitions to reduce CO2 emissions by 55%. The EU Green Recovery, about which panelists will speak in greater detail, aims at boosting economies affected by the pandemic while accelerating their transformation towards climate neutrality and sustainability. We expect that the political commitment from the top level of Japan's government will give further impetus to our joint efforts and projects. Bilaterally, Japan is one of our most important partners has signed an energy partnership with Germany in 2019. Together, we want to further the transition of energy policies and promote innovation, especially for offshore wind energy and green hydrogen. Finally, all policies designed by governments cannot succeed without support of civil society and the private sector. The protests by Fridays for Future all over the world have helped to raise the level of ambition. Innovations by private business initiatives and researchers contribute significantly to making the much needing transition feasible. I hope that this roundtable will give us the opportunity for an exchange of new ideas and an open, fruitful discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Lebel, for your opening remarks, uh, which has been very much encouraging us for further discussion uh, today. Now we would like to start the panel discussion. First, I would like to introduce the seven panelists whom I would now like to introduce. First, panelist is Mayor of Kyoto, Mr. Kadokawa. And we also have Ambassador of the European Union to Japan, Ms. Patricia Floor. We also have Ambassador of France to Japan, Mr. Philippe Seton. We also have Professor Yoshihiko Wada of Doshisha University. And from Fridays for Future Japan, we have Mr. Isao Sakai, organizer of the organization. We also have Dr. Kenichi Oshi Ishida, Managing Officer in Charge of Environmental Pre-Improvement, Sekisui House Limited, and Co-Founder and Representative Director of Social Innovation Japan, Ms. Mariko Maktier, is with us as well. So this is the seven-person panel. First, I would like to ask, give opportunities to each panelist to make a brief statement. But before doing so, let me give you a brief background in terms of my experience in fight against the global warming. As has been introduced by the mayor of Kyoto, 
In December 1997, I was working for the Ministry of the Environment, and I was serving as the assistant to the chair of COP3. This is the picture that was taken back then, and this is how I looked 20, some 20 years ago. And with this experience, I have been designated as today's moderator of this program. Without further ado, I would like to start the panel discussion. And I'd first like to hear from Mayor of Kyoto, Mr. Kadokawa. Due to the limited time, please limit the time to three minutes. Thank you very much in advance for your cooperation. Mayor of Kyoto, please. Thank you. The birth of Kyoto Protocol has given birth to uh, served as the springboard for Kyoto and its people to roll out initiatives to fight against global warming. For example, Eco Kids Challenge Life was rolled out, which to date have had 110,000 alumni children in this program. We also have 222 school districts that is working towards a lower carbon emission level. With 38 universities and colleges in Kyoto, we are also a city of higher education. It also is home to a traditional industry, state of the technologies and venture businesses. The beautiful tradition of cooperation among the industry, academia, and the public sector has facilitated the spirit of innovation as well. Energy efficient silicon carbide has thus been developed while plant-based cellulose nan nanofiber that is one-fifth the weight but five times the strength of iron is now reaching to the stage of practical use. The population level remained flattish and we also have a massive increase in tourists. However, energy consumption has been reduced by 28% and the volume of waste have been ne nearly halved. Percentage of people or visitors coming to Kyoto has been reduced by 80% over the years. Also, the proportion of automobile use for transportation has been reduced by 20%, while the public transportation usage has increased by 30%. And we also have declared as our official goal to achieve the zero emission by 2050. And that initiative has been followed suit by more than 170 municipalities. Working together with the younger people, like those from Fridays for Future Japan, and with the young officials of Kyoto, we have been currently working on the amendment of the city ordinance, which I hope will be adopted the day after tomorrow to include articulated promulgation of the net zero emission by 2050 in the ordinance. We also be expanding the installation of renewable energies obligation, in addition to the mandatory reporting of energy consumption, not only by small, or large, but also SMEs. Have the floor, please. Yes, um, thank you, um, Takemoto-san. And um, first of all, um, um, my apologies again, um, Mayor Kadokawa-san, to you and also to the president of the Shisho University, Ueki-san, because believe me, the EU ambassador group would have liked to come and visit. And I pledge to you, we will do, it's only postponed. But it's good that we can meet um, virtually today. So let me immediately start by saying that um, actually we owe it to Kyoto. Your city led the way to the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and it greatly enhanced um, the world um, awareness if, if in the need for climate action. It was also the first time that the international community actually agreed on politically binding targets for addressing climate change. 2015, the Paris Agreement took another key step. 
So from the commitments of Kyoto, we went to the first universal legally binding climate change agreement. The real challenge though is implementation. Will governments of the world be true to their Paris obligations? And in that regard, of course, then the EU highly welcomes the, the commitment by Prime Minister Suga and by Japan. Now, certainly the EU and its member states will uphold the Paris Agreement. It is what our European citizens, our civil society and a growing number of businesses are asking us to do. And it is the right thing to do. So if you want proof, look at the European Green Deal. It aims to lead the EU towards a modern, resource efficient and competitive economy there, where there are no net emissions of greenhouse gases in 2050. And yes, it will demand a fundamental transformation of our economy and society. But it's the right way to go. And as um, the president of um, the European Commission von der Leyen says, in Europe, we are convinced that it will also serve as our new EU growth strategy. We can create jobs, increase competitiveness, boost innovation, while at the same time reducing the emissions. We have already achieved this decoupling in Europe. Between 1990 and 2019, the EU economy grew by 62%, while emissions decreased by 25%. The European Green Deal and the EU call for a green recovery from the coronavirus pandemic is being translated into new policies as we speak. Europe aims to be the first climate neutral continent through our 2050 climate neutrality pledge, which will be enshrined in the European climate law currently in the legislative process, hopefully to be adopted soon. In order to supply clean, affordable and secure energy to all Europeans, we need an energy system where primary energy supply will largely come from renewable energy sources. The use of fossil fuels needs to end to fully decarbonize Europe's energy supply. To do justice to the sustainable development goals of the UN and the Paris Agreement, we also need to mobilize our industries for a clean and circular economy through recycling and reuse and increased energy efficiency of production processes. This will go a long way to reduce pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. In the transport sector, we need to go to sustainable and smart mobility through more environmentally friendly fuels, shift to low and zero emission vehicles. Let me conclude by saying, in 2015, the Paris Agreement reflected a global awareness and acknowledgement that concrete action is urgent. Five years on in 2020, we've all read the alarming news the Arctic ice melts faster than predicted with sea levels rising. Californians and Australians could not breathe because of unprecedented wildfires. And typhoons are stronger than ever before. We need to act now and together because there's no planet B for humankind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Floor, for your initial presentation. Now let me invite the next speaker, Ambassador Philippe Seton of France. Ambassador Seton, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as an introductory remark, uh, remarks, I'd like to point out the, the, the following. First, uh, uh, of course, the Paris Agreement was the culmination of more than 20 years of climate negotiations. Uh, where also the Kyoto Protocol uh, in 1997 was, uh, of course, a major step. Uh, uh, this uh, agreement is also the result of a uh, huge uh, mobilization from the entire international community, which as uh, French, we like to refer to as the spirit of Paris. Uh, uh, and uh, today, uh, as well as the fifth anniversary of the adoption of this agreement, this, this year is also the first year of its implementation. 
and uh, we know that uh, there is still a lot of work uh, that remains to be done in order to attain our target of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We know that each year over the past decade, greenhouse gas emissions have grown by an average of 1.5%. 1 and at the current rate of greenhouse gas emissions, global warming could reach up to four degrees Celsius at the very beginning of next century. This is why our priority must now be to translate our commitments into public policies, contributing to an in-depth to in-depth changes, as well as to adopt new ambitious commitments. And uh, if we are to stay within sustainable limits as defined in the Paris Agreement, we indeed need to do more and faster. It is in that context and uh, in order to put climate change back at the top of the international agenda that uh, the UN, uh, the UK, France, in partnership with Chile and Italy, have decided to organize a virtual summit on December 12, which is the date of the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the Paris Agreement. And we do expect this summit of climate ambition to be a platform where countries will come to present new commitments against global warming. And our goal is for these commitments to allow us to improve the implementation of the Paris Agreement one year before the COP26 in Glasgow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Seton, for your initial presentation. We wish to come back to you later. Next, I would like to invite Professor Wada of Dorsetshire University to make a presentation. I am director of Dorsetshire University EU campus and a professor at Faculty of Economics, Dorsetshire University. I'm Wada. I'd like to talk about changes in awareness and behaviors of university students through ecological footprint diagnosis questionnaire. So briefly put, ecological footprint is the land area of ecosystem required for human economic activities. Including cropland and carbon footprint. And there are six categories of ecological footprint. And this land area is compared to a productive area or the biocapacity. And by comparing these two, we can see whether human economic activities are conducted within the capacity of the ecosystem. A research institution called the GFN says that in order to support economic activities of the humans, we require 1.7 planets, which means that demand is exceeding supply. We are in an overshoot situation. That is why fishing resources are declining and atmospheric CO2 is rising. With this pace, 10 years from now, some estimate that we will need two planets. In order to stop climate change, we have to change the mechanism of eco economy and consumption patterns. And the Japanese university students are set to not take action even after acquiring knowledge on environmental issues, according to some research results. So in order to think about what is required for university students to take action, I conducted a survey. 100 university students took the carbon footprint questionnaire. The respondents answered 18 questions on the website, and then it shows the results saying that how many planets your lifestyle requires. So the students took the questionnaire twice. The first time they reported 
the current situation. In the second round, I asked students to be creative so as to lead a lifestyle which only requires one planet. So this is the result. And in the first round, on average, the, their lifestyle required 1.75 planets. But in the second round, the number decreased to 1.09 planets. Analyzing comments by students, about 4% of the students started taking specific actions such as growing vegetable at home and unplugging TV sets when not using. And 56% clearly expressed intention to take action. And 82% gained awareness that their life was putting large burden on ecosystem. On the other hand, there were only 7% of students who felt powerless after taking the questionnaire. So as a result, we were able to see that about half of the students were able to start taking actions. And we received a lot of comments from those students. One says that people have told me to lead an environmentally friendly lifestyle, but I was unable to know how much action I should take. But now that quantification was shown, I was able to think more specifically how to reduce the number to one planet requirement. So this visualization has led to the behavioral change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wada, for concrete suggestions and triggers for transformative change. Thank you very much. I look forward to exchanging views later on this in this program. We would now like to give the microphone to Mr. Sakai of Fridays for Future Japan. Thank you very much. Can you see the slides? Thank you. Friday for Future Japan is an organization of the youth working towards the global warming. Thank you very much for this opportunity. In 2018, Greta to six months after the strike by Greta Thunberg, this Fridays for Future Japan activity have been launched and we now have 26 chapters across the country from Hokkaido all the way to Kyushu. Fridays for Future Japan is have two pillars. One is individual change and the other system change. In terms of individual change, we are trying to increase the literacy among the youth about climate change. Books or media or source of information that can allow the readers to comprehensively learn global change was difficult to be accessed in Japan. And that is why we are trying through a range of activities to raise the literacy of the youth. And also Global Climate March is a way to make it visual in terms of the passion and the eagerness of the youth. Also individual activities needs to be accompanied by the policies by the local as well as national government especially in terms of the 1.5 degree limits. And to this end, we are bringing it to the street and also appealing to the policymakers on this front. And we are also having all those lists of signatures and we are currently, we are the next generation stakeholders and we are also playing the role as the watchdog of the climate policies. And we believe that the impetus is getting stronger in terms of the climate action. And in order to ensure the 1.5 degree cap, we have to take relevant measures, especially toward 2030. We have already seen the temperature increase by one degree. And IPCC says that GHG Gusses needs to be cut by 45% to avoid the tipping point. And it is exactly for this reason that we have to accelerate our action towards 2030. And the climate policies that will be decided over the next 12 months will be having a grave impact in our effort towards the global climate actions. And energy mix 
towards 2030 will be reviewed sometime next year as well. We first have to make relevant changes by 2021 and to achieve the decarbonization by 2030 and 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sakai. Especially those young generation, their attitude and roles in climate action is very important. So I will talk to you once again uh, during the rounds of discussion. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Ishida, Managing Officer of Sikisi House. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Ishida from Sekisui House. First, I'd like to briefly introduce the environmental action of our company. Back in 1999, we had the future declaration on the environment based on the understanding that the environment is what we borrow from the future generation and that we need to return the, the environment in a clean form to the next generation. And then in 2005, when Kyoto, we decided to comply with the Kyoto Protocol with all the houses that are newly built with a 6% reduction of CO2 back then, based on sustainable declaration. But in 2008 at Toyako Summit, we also decided to have the decarbonization declaration based on the understanding that the former declaration was not enough. And then in 2008, the CO2 off housing, the trial sales of 100 houses started. And then after the trial sales in 2009, in order to reduce the CO2 emission by 50% compared to the 1990 level, we started selling our new models of houses. And then in 2020, zero energy housing will be the standard for newly built detached housing, which was declared by the government. And based on that understanding and declaration, we have been making effort. And in 2015, Paris Agreement was uh, signed. And in 2017, RE100 declaration was made. And we were also accredited for SBT initiative in 2018. And as a result, uh, last year, 87% of newly built houses in 2019 was zero energy house or ZECH as we call it. And I believe that that is the top track record in the world. And also we built 51,793 houses last year with ZECH standards and we succeeded in reducing CO2 emissions by 82.7% as of last year. We are operating in five countries on top of Japan. However, there are cultural differences. So zero energy house has not been built in other countries. However, in, over, in order to achieve the decarbonization goal, we would like to make all the houses around the world zero energy house. Thank you. Dr. Ishida, thank you very much housing industry's leadership led by Sekisu House was well encapsulated in his presentation. I look forward to exchanging views at the panel discussion. And last but not least, I would like to give the microphone to Ms. Mariko Maktir of Social Innovation Japan. Thank you very much. I'm from Social Innovation Japan. I'm the co-founder and director. I'm very pleased to be invited to this wonderful opportunity. Let me just make a brief self-induction of myself and the organization. I was a journalist by training and I worked for a newspaper company 
for some six years, and that was about eight to nine years ago. And I have been able to interview some of the wonderful social entrepreneurs. And we have lost the audio. And compared to Japan, I thought that Japan is a country with superb technology and human resources. And that should be playing a larger role in tackling global challenges. And with this in mind, I launched Social Innovation Japan. Bringing together all the people of all different walks of life, we have provided thematic workshops and seminars, for example, the ones on circular economies, showcasing Japanese and international cases. But I often felt, or oh, I also heard from Japanese companies that they had been aware of the need to create more circular services and products, but they also said that the market is not ripe just yet to make a full-fledged commitment. And that is why we launched a project called My Mizu. It is a, an app that allows the people to know where they can refill their water bottle for free. And we currently have more than 200,000 water refilling stations and it is a map-based app and involving a range of different players was the target of this project. And non-disposable my bottle, use of my bottle is being encouraged and I thought that we just wanted to make it more visible that there are a great number of people using their own bottles. Joined by major companies or local government, we currently have been pushing a cross-sectoral initiative and that is what we have been working on and i look forward to exchanging views later in this program thank you very much we heard many different initiatives they are all very important during the round of discussion we'd like to continue the conversation now based on the presentations that we've heard I have questions to the panelists. So let us begin the discussion. First round. The Kyoto Protocol will be looked at and also how Japan and EU changed due to the Paris Agreement. That is the theme of the first round. Now, Mayor Kadokawa, I'd like to ask you once again, Kyoto City is a pioneering city and front runner in leading initiatives in the world. So I have been looking at these constructive initiatives by Kyoto. So these initiatives have led to the entry into force of Kyoto Protocol as well as the global agreement, the Paris Agreement, as well as the entry into force, early entry into force of Paris Agreement. I think that your activities have contributed to this end. So I'd like to ask you how you rolled out international initiatives in Kyoto during this time. Mia, please. For us to decarbonate, international cooperation is very important, especially at city level. We have to work together with like-minded cities and local governments. There are four points. ICLE has been joined by more than 170 local governments across the world. And Kyoto City is serving as the chapter chair. And recent years, a number of Chinese cities have joined the network. Another is The organization has been the Climate Energy Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate Energy, which is joined by more than 1,000 cities across the world. Second is the contribution through international conferences. 
we try to attend as many international conferences as possible to share with our experiences at the same time learning from fellow city government as well. We also have provided for the IPCC General Assembly held last year in Kyoto as well. As mentioned, all Kyoto Elementary School is having Kids Echo Challenge initiative and we are currently sharing our experience with Malaysian elementary schools over the last eight years to replicate that program in Malaysian elementary schools. And also, we also have Environmental Education Center established at the time of COP3, and we are currently replicating this educational center in Malaysia as well. We also have a Earth Hall of Fame Kyoto award system to award individuals and entities that have made a great contribution to global environment. Dr. Wangari Matai has once been awarded with this prize as well. And we look forward to making solid contributions on this front as well. Mayor, thank you very much. As a leader of the world, I hope that Kyoto City will continue to lead the rest of the world. Now let me ask uh, one quick question to Ambassador Seton of uh, France. Uh, now my point is uh, EU and Japan worked together toward the adoption of Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and its entry into force in 2005. Then as the uh, COP21 presidency, France played a very important role in concluding COP21 in 2015 by adopting Paris Agreement, which is the historically significant achievement in addressing the global climate change. On the occasion to celebrate 50 year anniversary of Paris Agreement, I would like to ask you, Ambassador, for your insightful overviews on this development. Ambassador, you have the floor, please. Thank, thank you very much. Um, when it comes to the, the legacy of the Kyoto Protocol, I, I, I think one should underline that, of course, the Kyoto Protocol uh, uh, laid the ground for current international efforts to address climate change and for the recognition that climate change uh, is to be dealt with as a global matter uh, by the international community as a whole, both developed countries and emerging countries. And uh, based on the experience of the, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, another important change, uh, I think, uh, was uh, uh, and it was taken into account uh, uh, in uh, in the in the framework of the Paris Agreement. Uh, an important change lies in the recognition of the role of non-state actors for for climate action, in particular businesses, local governments, and uh, NGOs. This uh, recognition uh, has already deeply transformed the way our climate policies are conceived, both in Europe and in Japan. Uh, it led to uh, very encouraging, to encouraging the development of uh, new policy solutions and technologies, which are necessary for the uh, ecological transition. Reversely, voluntary commitments made by companies, cities, region or NGOs are also crucial for the state actors to commit to more action. And the initiatives uh, the mayor uh, Kedokawa just mentioned are exemplary in this regard. When it comes to France, if I may, uh, over the past five years, uh, uh, my country has actively committed itself to promoting and enhancing this very important role played by non-state actors. We have strived to develop a kind of a pragmatic approach where we work with the most voluntary actors, regardless of whether uh, they are states, local governments or companies, and where we show by example that it is possible to keep moving forward. 
Uh, France has uh, developed uh, this approach, especially after the decision made by President Trump to withdraw from the Paris Agreement and through what came to be called One Planet Summits. The first one was held in December 2017 in Paris. France has launched various coalitions of stakeholders to achieve concrete results uh, such as reducing CO2 emissions in the international maritime transport, reducing the cost of solar energy, ensuring a transition to zero carbon in the building sector, and supporting an efficient uh, energy cooling. But these are only few examples, uh, as such efforts have been happening all over the world. That is also why I'm very pleased and interested to hear other panelists present today, especially from the private sector and civil society on their contribution to the implementation of the Paris Agreement over the past five years. And I do thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks, which have covered a wide range of uh, initiatives made by France as well as the EU, including the uh, involvement of stakeholders. We wish to come back to you later again. Next, I would like to invite President, excuse me, Professor Wada of Doshisha University to answer this question. So you have been working with various organizations to estimate the ecological footprint in Kyoto City. You are the expert in this area. So these organizations, how should they utilize the results and outcomes of these estimations to change their behaviors and actions? Professor Wada, the floor is yours. Yes. First of all, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted in Kyoto International Conference Hall, and there is a, Earth, a research institute next to the International Hall, and I cooperated with that research institution. And carbon footprint was estimated in that research institution, and I cooperated with them. And what we realized is that the largest ecological footprint comes from the um, airplane use utilization, 50%, to go on a business trip, and 39% from the air conditioning in buildings. So I worked with the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature, and that was the result of the research. And the Institute would like to have more eco-friendly power generation planned. And considering that uh, overseas business trips can be a big ecological footprint contributor, they want to start using more webinar webinars. And they also would like to utilize eco-friendly fuels. They will be supporting development of such technologies. So if CO2 increases as a result of such research and development, and then afterwards in the long term, if we have a long term view, I believe that the application of such technologies can offset the increase of CO2 emission in the end. And Sustainer Kyoto, an educational institution, was established last year. And we also cooperated with that institution as well. But the results have not been accumulated yet. For example, who has the minimum ecological footprint? That kind of tournament sort of um, event is what we are trying to do in the future. Thank you very much for sharing your research results as to how these activities can be best utilized and capitalized on in real world. Now I would like to give the floor to Sakai-san of Fridays for Future Japan. Mr. Sakai is now studying at a U.S. college, and from your personal experience, will you share with us the sense of crisis towards the climate issues, or if there are any differences between Japanese and American perspectives 
please share them with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. I have been studying abroad in the United States from high school to undergrad, and I have two major points that I would like to share with you. One is the level of sense of crisis, which is more widely shared in the U.S. society in terms of climate crisis. In a divided America, however, maybe the information or the sense of crisis I am feeling in a liberal college where I'm studying may not really be representative of the entire U.S. However, professors or classmates often refer to global issues in their classrooms or along with a social network posting, so Black Lives Matter even, to discuss climate issue as well. And even those who are not really an in climate issue are sharing the passion of action needed for global action. When I was in high school, when I talk about climate issues, I have been given any skeptic reviews or have been considered as someone who is a bit strange. So there has been some changes or maybe a difference if you make a comparative analysis between American and Japanese educational settings. So accessibility to accurate information is key here. As my classmate says, I have taken some environmental engineering lecture, which has given me a trigger for me to get into this field of activity. Another point, as was exemplified by the Black Lives Matter movements, people rise up to demanding change on the street. And the hurdle is lower in the United States to take it to the street. And maybe the situation is the same in Europe as well. Actions or advocacies now enjoy lower hurdles in European or American country. But this is not to say that Japan is behind these countries. Literacy is getting higher in the Japanese society as well, and that is where I want to work on as well. Thank you very much. How to raise awareness and build awareness and how to lead that awareness to action. That is a very important point. So in the second round, I will ask you a deeper question on that. Next, from Sekisui House, Mr. Ishida, I would like to ask you a question. Earlier in your presentation, you introduced to us that Sekisui House has been working on this matter as a leading company in the housing industry. What left a strong impression on me is that your company has been taking active initiatives from very early on. So what made that possible? What was the enabler that allowed you to work on this issue from very early on? Thank you very much for the question. The Japanese companies have focused on stakeholders in the management practice, especially compared to other goods, houses have long life, such as for 50 years or 100 years, we have to support the goods for a long time. For So in order to do business in this industry, we have to prosper and develop for a very long period, for 50 years to come. And to achieve that, we need to be needed by the society. Therefore, we need the management which will be responsible to the future generations. And these future generations will be our future customers as well. Our company mission is not to provide housing. We are providing happy life to our customers. Happy life means peace of mind and safety and comfort. We need all that. So we have been providing such high levels of functions the Great East Japan Earthquake and the Kumamoto Earthquake, 6 House has proven that the residents' lives have been saved thanks to our houses. However, due to the flooding and the uh, water-related disasters, 6 houses have been damaged. So in abnormal weather conditions, we cannot 
fulfill our company mission to provide happy life. Therefore, we have to work on the climate change issue. That is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Social roles played by business sector was emphasized in his presentation, which I'm very interested to know more. Now, last but not least, microphone goes to Ms. Maktir. With her experience in Europe, especially in London, I would like to know her experiences in her activities. And after the adoption of Paris Agreement, it is now getting into the implementation phase. Over the last five years or so, how has the society changed? Can you share with us how you look at the changes? Thank you. Over the last five years, the UK, I know it, or the Europe, or also in Japan, have gone through major changes, especially in Europe. Consumer behavior have changed dramatically. For example, my friend in Germany often criticizes me when I go to Germany to event an event. And maybe that was a comment. I would be caught of God if I have given such an opinion eight or nine years ago. So individual changes make specific contributions to collective efforts as well. And that is the trend that is more widely seen in Europe. And thanks to this positive trend, not as a marketing activity, we are, businesses are seeking business feasibilities and they are now more highly aware of the need to change their business model. Local government or be it business, they are now asking themselves as to what they should be doing and they are looking for good examples or the role models and the Fridays for Future and other consumer activities are also the cases that demonstrate the highest rate of attention to plastic waste and other issues. So we now move on to the second round of the discussion. The theme of the second round of discussion is about the next steps. We would like to discuss the future. What will be the next steps to reach carbon neutrality in 2050? Now that both EU and Japan are aiming to achieve that, as well as what will be the next steps to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees by 2100? Now that we are going to talk about the future, I'd like to ask Mr. Sakai the first question. My question is this. For a young generation that shoulders Japan and the world in the future, are there any requests to the older generation and as a member of the younger generation, how do you plan to make contribution to climate issues? Sakai-san, please. If I am to make a request or two, these are my requests. As French and other ambassadors have stated, tipping point in the Arctic or broad base forest fire, all tells that we are running out of time. And by 2030, we have to come up with concrete and sufficient actions in place. Carbon neutrality announcement. A climate action tracker last week says that the best case scenario can achieve a temperature increase of 2.1 degrees. So 1.5 degree 
goal is now within reach, and this is exactly why we believe that acceleration of actions is needed at this point in time. And as Dr. Ishida mentioned, business and policy decision-making processes should, should involve perspectives of the youth, not only Fridays for Future Japan, but also all the other segments of the youth. They have their agendas and they should also, they are also making proposals as well. And generation even younger than us are aware of the fact that the economic growth is not necessarily the source of happiness. So these kind of perspectives should be involved and reflected in policies going forward. And not only limited, in, including but not limited to climate issues. Poverty and other issues should be also considered as well. And this climate action should involve not only Japanese, but also other people in other countries as well. And this action should be more comprehensive leaving no one behind. This is the fairness in terms of climate action. Our future policies should benefit from input by a wider range of people, and I want to be the part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Ms. Maxtier, based on your experience, in order to make a contribution to global warming, how can Japan and you work together? Can you share with us your viewpoint? Ms. Maktir, please. Thank you. Both EU and Japan can learn a lot from each other. For example, EU level policies have also facilitated the process and that is something that Japan can possibly learn from it. And Japan too has been working on the issues of sustainability with a Jap Japan unique concept of motainai or satoyama initiatives. And there have been sustainable business models in the Japanese tradition as well. So we can learn from each other. Also be it in Japan or in EU, passion is very important. And it is very encouraging that the passion is spreading across the young generation and Fridays for Use Japan and other civil organizations should be more actively engaged as well. Thank you. Now, Professor Wada of Doshisha University. Carbon neutrality by 2050, that is what Japan and EU are aiming to achieve. Regarding these large policy directions, as an expert working on ecological footprint research and education, how will you be contributing to this movement? Professor Wada, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, there are several points that I can talk about. This is by WWF. It's one planet lifestyle. It's for kindergartners and grade schoolers and such educational materials need to be developed. This is another one by WWF and we would like to cooperate with WWF and other organizations on this front. And the second point is about food. Food is related to carbon footprint. Kyoto City, what 24% comes from food in terms of carbon footprint and 30% of that is a, a carbon footprint. And so Japan has been importing a lot of food from other countries. So using footprint, we want to continue visualizing that. And 
Mayor Kadokawa has been working on local consumption, local pro production for school lunches. I highly appreciate that initiative. Rice is produced in Kyoto, which is used in school lunch. But uh, local production, local consumption related a menu is only provided once or twice a month. So we want the number to be increased. And also composting raw uh, garbage and trash, that is also important to reduce carbon footprint. In Minamata city, the raw uh, trash is already being composted. And as a result, the heavy oil utilization has been reduced. If all the municipalities in Japan do the same, then the carbon footprint can be reduced for the scale of Shikoku Island. So composting may be difficult for large urban cities, but we would like that to be promoted. That is my request. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to move on to Mr. Ishida from Sekisui House. As you said in the presentation, Sekisui House has been promoting zero emission house, ZEH or ZEH, that is a pioneering initiative. So as a next step, what will be other initiatives that you might be taking? Can you share your thoughts on this? Thank you very much. In terms of detached houses, about 90% of the houses that we build are already zero emission houses, but we have rental housing and condominiums as well. So going forward, we want to make all of these uh, buildings zero emission, especially uh, Greta Thunberg and young people, as we heard from some of the panelists, are aware that the climate change is their own business. They want to make contributions, but there are people who don't know how to make contributions. So we believe that customers can build zero emission house to contribute to climate action, but young people cannot build their own houses. So they will probably rent a condominium or house. So CKC House in this regard started providing zero emission condominiums and rental houses. When you select a rental house, you probably look at the distance from the closest station or the age of the building. But in the future, we want the customers to select where to live based on whether or not the, the building is zero emission. And as I said, we are doing business around the world. So we want to make all the houses zero emission and carbon neutral. And in relation to what Ms. Maktira said, since 2018, we eliminated the plastic bottles from the vending machines and we are promoting my bottles. And we have been able to reduce 340,000 plastic bottles from the company. And I told someone about this, and this person wondered how important it is that Sekisui House works on this. But I believe that this is the way for us to send a message to the customers. I think that this will be a, a very big power. And I believe that everyone needs to take part. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kadokawa of Kyoto. Kyoto City, prior to the government, national government, has declared its intention to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And in that sense, Kyoto is leading not only Japan, but also other countries in the world. What is your perspectives going forward? And what is your ambition going forward as well? CO2 zero emission should be taken for granted in our future world. And we have to be determined at the municipal level as well. Two years from time, Cultural Affairs Agency of Japan will be fully relocated to Tokyo, a Kyoto with enhanced capabilities. So they come here 
with stronger capabilities, and they will give value to culinary and other aspects of culture. And as has been mentioned, I would like to bring your attention to Kyoto's culinary culture, which is healthy, delicious, and friendly to the environment. And this kind of culinary culture needs to be promoted. Seki Sui's housing ideology is very important as well. Another important aspect is rightful mobility. And Kyoto is a student's uh, is a city of students. Over 12,000 students in Kyoto are working together with students across the world. We should not be leaving no one behind. Even under the pandemic, we have to work together and we also have to maintain the momentum towards the climate action. We have to concurrently achieve environmental as well as economic goals as well without leaving anyone learning together, learning from each other, stepping positive steps forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your input. <clears throat> Leadership by Kyoto Mayor is strongly needed, and I look forward to seeing your leadership as well. Thank you very much. Uh, my question as, is as follows. EU has already committed itself to carbon neutrality in 2050 as the world leader, as the highest priority area of European Green Deal. And uh, you are also working to further develop your policy and the measures toward the deeper cut of its GHG emissions in 2030, as uh, already introduced uh, in the uh, previous session. Recently in Japan, uh, also Prime Minister Suga pledged the carbon neutrality in 2050. In light of this, I would like to ask two ambassadors, Ambassador Seton and Ambassador Floor, for your thoughts for further actions to address global climate challenge. Now, let me ask first Ambassador Seton uh, for your uh, comment in this regard. Uh, Ambassador Seton, you have the floor, please, first. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, to, to answer your, your question, I think, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, possibilities uh, first to learn from each other and also to develop uh, further cooperations and, and uh, projects uh, with, uh, with Japan uh, in, in many, many fields. Uh, the first uh, should be, of course, uh, the, ener the energy mix. Uh, I think uh, 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 um, uh, renewable energies such as solar, uh, wind, geothermal must must be uh, expanded uh, in order to uh, transition from a grey to a green society. Uh, uh, we should also take into account the possible contribution of renewable and low carbon hydrogen as well as the possible contribution of nuclear, nuclear energy. Uh, um, uh, that's uh, that's the uh, first uh, uh, first example. Uh, going carbon neutral uh, uh, by uh, 2015 uh, also takes uh, us to financial and investment decisions, and it calls to solidarity. For instance, by making clean energy and mobility accessible to all citizens, and supporting other countries uh, towards carbon neutrality. Uh, uh, as it was already said, uh, investments will also increase, for example, in housing renovation, low carbon vehicles, public transport, cycling infrastructure. Uh, and uh, if I may add, uh, uh, lastly, if, if we are to remain uh, uh, on a trajectory of uh, 1, 1. 1.5 degrees Celsius, biodiversity should also uh, be bound to climate change reduction efforts. 
uh, both climate and uh, biodiversity are intrinsically linked. Uh, climate change is one of the main identified cause of the collapse in uh, biodiversity and reciprocally um, by integrating biodiversity into policy plans and through uh, set targets uh, we get co-benefits on climate. Uh, so I think we must protect natural in, uh, environments such as forests, oceans, uh, what we call carbon sinks as they can absorb greenhouse gases and also promote sustainable uh, agriculture and agroforestry which are also as vital as other means to limit global warnings. So those are uh, uh, from my point of view only examples. Once again I think uh, there are many fields of possible contribution uh, and cooperation with Japan, all the more uh, after the, the announcements by Prime Minister Suga in October, uh, which were, uh, of course, uh, a major step towards uh, the COP26. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador Setum, uh, for your comments, and uh, in particular, the, uh, your uh, point. Uh, the, uh, in regard to the uh, further cooperation between uh, EU, France, and uh, Japan. Now, uh, finally, let me ask uh, Ambassador Flor of EU uh, for your comments as the uh, last speaker in this uh, session. Ambassador, you have the floor, please. Yes. Uh, thank you um, very much. And first of all, let me say that um, we need behavioral change by individuals and by societies, both in the European Union and, of course, in Japan. And so, therefore, I really agree with um, the mayor uh, and with others on this particular point. And um, the EU supports uh, the covenant of mayors and is working with civil society strongly to encourage that. But what's the responsibility of governments here? I think we should look towards COP26 in Glasgow in November 2021, because that is the moment where all governments should demonstrate their commitment to the Paris Agreement by reviewing and upgrading their nationally determined contributions, their NDCs. Because I agree with Sakai-san, we have to avoid to get to the tipping point so the European Commission actually has proposed to increase the EU's 2030 emission reduction target to 55% from the current 40%. And it's now for the EU heads of state and government to make this decision very soon. And that would allow us then to submit, to submit this new NDC to COP26. And of course, I would be looking forward to also a new Japan pledge regarding the 2030 targets. Because otherwise we cannot achieve really to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade. So for the EU, we will also review energy efficiency and re renewable energy targets. The French ambassador has already talked about renewable energies, just to say that um, we would actually want to scale up our commitments on renewable energy and energy efficiency by 2030. Because if we don't do so, we won't get to decarbonize um, economies and societies by 2050. Now, we have also a new EU strategy on offshore wind power. So we want to actually increase EU offshore wind capacity from the current 12 gigawatts to 300 gigawatts by 2050 it would be a 25 times capacity increase. And it's a good example, I think, offshore wind power where Japan and the EU can actually work together. Japan is in the process of building a number of offshore wind parks. And of course, from the EU side and also European technology and businesses would be most willing to cooperate on that. There's been some talk about energy efficiency of buildings. And let me say that again, the EU is looking at a new renovation wave initiative to allow houses to become really um, more climate and energy efficient. Now, speaking with um, the mayor of Kyoto once again, we agree that we need to also ensure that no one is left behind. 
everybody needs to benefit from this transformation of our economies and society. And for that, the EU actually wants to create a just transition mechanism with um, uh, about 100 billion euros to support regions impacted by this um, radical transformation, including the coal producing regions. And again, Japan faces the same problems and therefore we can cooperate on that too. Um, I, it was interesting to notice that nobody spoke about COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic um, that much. So let me just say that the EU call is to go for a green recovery. As we repower and restart our economies, let's take this opportunity to build back better and to invest in a green future. And that's actually what the EU recovery budget and the budget for the next seven years is pledging um, to do. Well, Japan and the EU are natural close partners. Let's go for this challenge together. And so we want to work towards our shared goal, which is climate neutrality by 2050. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your challenging comment to conclude our session. Thank you very much once again, Ambassador. Thank you very much, all the panelists, for your active participation in the panel discussion. Thanks to your contribution, we believe that we have been able to have a very meaningful discussion. I must admit that we have received a number of questions from the audience, but due to the time limited time, we cannot entertain them at this time. Please forgive us. And with this, I would now like to close the panel discussion. Thank you again very much for the input by all the panelists. I would now like to receive some closing remarks. to deliver our closing remarks. Your Excellency, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Mayor of Kyoto, Mr. Kudokawa, dear President, Mrs. Oeki, dear colleagues, ambassadors, and dear participants. Of course, I would uh, first like to extend my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this important event and to the panelists and discussants which have today shared with us their views underline the shortcomings, but most importantly, presented ideas for the future work in our common path to carbon neutrality. Uh, due to the rich debate in today's event, it would be inappropriate for me to try to make any uh, summaries. However, allow me to stress few points which I believe are crucial and were mentioned also today's many times, so sort of as a wrap up. Failing to reward the course of climate change is not an option. It is absolutely crucial time in human history to do that. There are very predictable catastrophes of humankind if we do not act, and you have mentioned some of them, pollution, inadequate water supplies, demographic problems, and so forth. Thus, setting the goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 is to be made by each of us. It is not a matter to be discussed only by politicians, we can all contribute to this goal in making the right choices in everyday life. I understand that many students are listening to us today. Your role in this fight is crucially important, more than you might ever think. You are the ones who can make a big change by demanding politics to make into account your futures and by setting a good example by enhancing sustainability in all spheres of your life. Carbon neutrality and other goals set towards sustainable future cannot be achieved by one state alone. As the COVID pandemic revealed, we are interconnected and dependent in finding common solutions. Uh, I believe that in this urgent need for cooperation, European countries and Japan can be the pioneers. I believe we have the political will, we have the capacity in economical, scientific and technological fields and what is most important, we have the people, the citizens, who understand the need to act swiftly and efficiently. Also, Slovenia, as a new member state and the incoming EU presidency in 2021, 
we will work tirelessly towards this goal. Slovenia will not only set and implement national strategies on carbon neutrality and circular economy, but will also do its best in promoting a common agenda among all EU member states and mostly in finding partners like Japan to make an impact globally. I believe that having today's event in Kyoto is more than appropriate. This city is a symbol of fight against climate change. It is a symbol of joint action for the better future. This is why it is also so important that Japan alongside, together with the EU, has set the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. I'm truly convinced that together we can achieve it. Thank you all for listening to today's event. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Petrovic, for your remarks as the incoming EU presidency. Thank you very much, Ambassador, once again. Thank you. Now, uh, I would like to invite uh, His Excellency, Mr. Giorgio Stadace, Ambassador of Italy to Japan, for his remarks. Your Excellency, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much, uh, dear Mayor Kadokawa, uh, dear Presidents of the Doshisha University, dear Ambassador Flor, uh, dear Ambassadors and colleagues, uh, dear all, today is a great honor uh, and pleasure for me to be part of the closing remarks of this important event. Organized to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the signature of the Paris Agreement. This is a very important occasion, so it comes timely, uh, and also to welcome the recent declaration of Prime Minister uh, uh, Suga on Japan climate engagement. We are very pleased to have Japan uh, as a friend and ally to reach the common goal of carbon neutrality within 2050 in tune has clearly emerged and demonstrated in the, today's roundtable with the European Union commitments. Prime Minister Suga stated that the goal on 2050 would offer to Japan new opportunities for economic development. The European Union Green Deal is exactly affirming the same concepts. Rest assured that together, as members of the European Union family, we, we give priority to green recovery to uh, restore our national economy so deeply affected by the COVID pandemic, as uh, uh, clearly remarked also by uh, Ambassador Flor. As for Japan, we are pleased to read on a daily basis about the national commitment to boost investment in technologies in order to tackle climate change and to turn renewable into a primary energy source. To give just one concrete example, an action plan recently finalized by a Japanese government panel called for building the infrastructure to produce 30 gigawatts of capacity through renewable energy by 2040 equivalent to 30 large thermal uh, power uh, generators. Italy, as an EU founding member, is like-minded in dealing with climate change, and I am proud to represent a leading country in the use and production of, and production of uh, energy from renewable sources. Thanks to our technological leadership in managing smart grid systems, we are already in line with the European, European objectives for 2030, and we will certainly go beyond them. And uh, why guaranteeing growth opportunity for our economy? Moreover, our government is currently in the process of uh, defining a new national long-term strategy with the aim of reaching reaching climate neutrality by 2050. Indeed, I believe that Italian and European companies are renewed global champions in abating emissions, also in the hard to abate traditional sectors, 
and have by far anticipated the current trend by developing leadership in renewable, circular economy, electrification, hydrogen, bio biomethane, efficiency, and an array of technologically very innovative solutions. Allow me to recall that Italy, proudly representing the European Union values and principles in the field of climate change, took up the challenge of the COP26 organization together with the United Kingdom. Among the preparatory events, Italy will soon host the pre-COP and will strive to make it a success, smoothing the way to the COP in Glasgow. In view also of COP26, Italy believes that the recent uh, commitment of Japan will be crucial to call all the relevant parties to a higher level of ambition concerning climate change action. European Union, Italy and Japan are here to show the world that the clean growth is possible and most importantly is economically viable. Thank you so much for your kind uh, attention. Thank you, arigato gozaimashita. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Storace, for your remarks. Now to conclude the session, I'd like to say a few words. Today, thank you very much for staying with us until the end of this round table session. Uh, Mayor Karukawa of Kyoto City and Ambassador Floor and many ambassadors of the EU member states, thank you very much for joining us to commemorate the fifth anniversary of Paris Agreement. We are connecting the EU, Japan and Paris to talk about the priority issue, the climate change. We have heard from um, the representatives of many stakeholders who are working on climate action. Thank you very much for your contributions, especially as discussed today toward the future. Japan and the EU can work together in various areas and we can also cooperate with the citizens. We once again recognize that and also we need to engage the young generation in making decisions in the future. Climate action toward the future is a very important action that needs to continue for a long time. We need to be persistent and in that regard we need to strengthen EU-Japan relations further and further. As we were able to recognize that once again, this discussion was a very fruitful session. To conclude the session, I'd like to thank all the co-organizers, Delegation of the European Union to Japan, EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation, Embassy of France in Japan, and Doshisha University, as well as the panelists and all the members of the audience who joined us online. With that, I'd like to close my remarks. This concludes today's roundtable. Thank you very much for your attention.